Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You, you, you? you are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. If you're a non-Catholic uh, listening or watching us today and you've got some questions about the Catholic faith, we are here for you. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us outside of North America, please dial the U.S. country code and then 205 205- 271-2985. Now, if you're uh, watching us today on television, you can participate as well by shooting us an email, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. Charles Beery is our producer. Matt Kabinsky is our phone screener. Jeff Burson handles social media for us. We're on Facebook and YouTube uh, streaming right now. If you want to ask a question via one of those two platforms, just put your question in the comments box Jeff will see it. He'll shoot it to us here in the studio. Hopefully we can get that question answered on today's program. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Great. How are you, my friend? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well, thank you. Glad to hear that. We have an interesting email here from uh, Jesse from Melbourne, Australia. Jesse says, recently I registered for RCIA in my parish here in Australia. My wife is Hindu. She is perplexed at my conversion and often mocks my newfound faith. Uh, She has no respect for humility, poverty, or love of neighbor, and struggles with loving one's enemy. She feels these are the paths to failure and ignominy and would be an obstacle for our daughter. How can I approach her Hindu beliefs as well as her stance on having no time for humility, loving one's enemies, etc.? Also, any book recommendations? Thanks, Jesse in Melbourne. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. I I think the best way to respond to your wife's rejection of the virtues of humility and charity is to practice humility and charity, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So she will respond positively when you treat her well, when you're not proud and censorious and overbearing and when you take an interest in her welfare and, Mm -hmm. and when you exhibit these things, when you exemplify them, that's, the, I think, the best way to persuade her. Um, you know, I could say a lot about points of commonality between various forms of Hinduism, and the Catholic faith, and I mean, the figure of Gandhi comes to mind, mm-hmm. for example, mm-hmm. as well as many others, who have certainly uh, preached an ethic of compassion. I mean, many of the Hindu people that I know uh, are exemplary, both for their humility and their charity. So I, I don't think her, her attitude is characteristic by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but all that may be pointless, like actually, you know, trying to engage in a dialogue. She seems rather dead set about this. So I think the way to overcome it is with humility and charity. Sounds good to me. Jesse, thanks so much for listening to us in Australia. Here's a question now from Mary. This came in uh, via YouTube. How can a person who has been excommunicated still have the possibility of being in sanctifying grace? I thought excommunication means you are no longer in union with the church. Yeah, thank you. So excommunication is a disciplinary disciplinary procedure that the church uses rarely uh, in uh, what appears to be cases of grave sin and Mm -hmm. obstinate obstinate sin at that. So uh, because it is a discipline that requires the prudential judgment of a bishop or the Holy See to execute, there's always the possibility of prudential error on the part of the bishop or the or the pope who who uh, institutes the excommunication. So. It's possible for the ordinary, uh, the authority in this ish, in instance, to be mistaken about the facts of the case and about the person's spiritual disposition and their willingness to be repentant. Uh, the, a discipline can also be misused. So let's say, for example, uh, you have a pope or a bishop who uses the dis- discipline of excommunication flagrantly, profligately, to further their own self-aggrandizing ag- agenda. I mean, such things have happened. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean— uh, I have no opinion personally on the sanctity of Savonarola. I don't have an opinion about whether he was saintly or not. But, you know, Savonarola, the famous uh, uh, reformer who called out the clergy for their corruption and, you know, called on people to live holy lives mm-hmm. and who got excommunicated for his pains, <laughs> it's easy to see how a corrupt bishop, you know, might have made a false judgment in yeah, that case. Yeah. And so the uh, uh, 
Only God knows the soul. The bishop has to do his dead level best to make a fair judgment about a person's behavior for the sake of the common good, for the body, you know, body of Christ, and also for that individual soul. But bishops are fallible people. They can make mistakes. Yeah. Mary, thanks for watching us on YouTube. Here's an email from Bill. Recently, a well-read Catholic in a discussion with me mentioned the concept of prevenient grace. He explained that everybody gets it to prevent us from damning ourselves, but it doesn't save anybody. Well, what good is that grace that helps save me but won't do the job? Aren't we saved by grace? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. So prevenient here means coming before. That's the sense of the word prevenient. And uh, before you make an act of faith and repentance in the gospel, mm -hmm. uh, that, that motion of the soul has to come from somewhere, and it can't come from you, like exclusively, right? okay. because we're locked in sin and original sin and concupiscence and pride, and something has to nudge us enough to, to make us reach out to God and, and seek that help. Uh, so, and we're, we're, we're asking for something that exceeds the power of nature. I mean, we're, you know, when I'm not looking for a therapist exclusively or, you know, a good meal or, you know, maybe a, a lottery ticket, I'm, I'm looking for sanctifying grace from heaven, right? This is something that's supernatural. And so the power to do that actually comes from prevenient grace. Now, that's not the only kind of grace. So when one responds to the gospel with faith and repentance and receive the sacraments, then one receives sanctifying grace. And sanctifying grace is the grace that actually makes you holy and acceptable to God. And then if we cooperate with that sanctifying grace and persevere in it, we can be saved. All right. Very good. One quick one here as we're going to break. Uh, this is from Lisa. How many dogmas and how many doctrines does the Catholic Church have? And is there a good website to read about these? Lots. Lots. I can't enumerate all of them. Uh, a few hundred. And the, uh, they're, they're hierarchically ranked, however, so if you, you know, consult a Google site or something on, uh -huh. on listing the dogmas of the Catholic faith, you'll find things that you never would have thought in a thousand years could be dogmas, mm -hmm. right? Um, that are, it would seem quite obscure to you and, and are articulated in a completely different cultural and philosophical context. Some stuff out of, say, the high Middle Ages. Um, but the biggies, things like the existence of God and the Trinity and the incarnation of Christ and the atonement of the death of Christ, the nature of the sacraments, these are things that are very relevant to us on a day-to-day -day basis, and they're the ones you really need to know. Now, in terms of resources, uh, Ludwig Ott's Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma is a great place to go for that kind of list. Sounds good. Lisa, thanks so much for your email. Calls are coming in right now at 833-288-EWTN. Stay with us. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. I don't like looking back. I prefer to look forward and keep moving forward. There's plenty to cover. I do a lot of research and try to dig out the bits and pieces of a life or of yes. an agenda that people don't want to talk about. The World Over with Raymond Arroyo. Thursday night, 8 Eastern on EWTN Radio and Television. Have you ever heard someone say, all religions are basically the same thing. They only differ in their external forms, in the way they express it. G.K. Chesterton says the truth is precisely the other way around. The religions of the world do not greatly differ in rites and forms. They do differ greatly in what they teach. There's only one religion that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that he suffered and died for our sins, that he rose from the dead. Only one religion that believes in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Spend more time with the Apostle of Common Sense. Visit Chesterton.org for more information and go to EWTNRC.com to discover more books and programs written and inspired by G.K. Chesterton. It's called a communion here on EWTN. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. We're going to begin today with Brandon in Grand Island, Nebraska, listening to us on YouTube. Hey there, Brandon. What's on your mind today, sir? Hey, hey thank you for taking my call. First, sure. I'd like to uh, express my uh, sympathy to the families of uh, Star Trek icon Nichelle Nichols yes. and basketball great Bill Russell. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
My question is, uh, how can I, with the uh, images of the James Webb Space Telescope and the upcoming launch of Artemis One, how can I bring the Word of God to uh, everybody? Hmm. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate the question, and I appreciate the sentiment, rather. And, you know, I, I don't know that it's my responsibility or yours to bring the Word of God to everyone. I, I think it's our responsibility to manifest the grace of Christ to those that we meet and to be a light. And the way that light shines is going to depend on our particular vocation and our charisms and our personality. So, you know, you referenced the, the, the telescope and the, the discoveries of natural science. Mm -hmm. If you are a scientist, then uh, you live your Catholic faith through your scientific vocation. If you are a historian, you live your Catholic faith through your life as a historian. If you're a husband, you live your Catholic faith through your vocation to be a husband. Mm -hmm. If you're a priest, you live it through your vocation to be a priest. So the way we exhibit the grace of Christ, manifest, give evidence to the truth of the gospel, will depend on our particular state of life, right? Um, now, I, I think the best way to learn about this would be to study the lives of actual scientists. So... His name escapes me for the moment. I can't think of it. But there's an American astrophysicist, a Jesuit, um, who currently heads the Vatican Observatory, mm -hmm. uh, who has written extensively on his vocation as both a priest and a Catholic scientist and how that works out in his own case. Yeah. Now, that there's not one way to do this. There's somebody else that has spent an awful lot of time thinking about the relationship of faith to science in the Catholic domain would be Father Spitzer. So we have a show on EWTN called Father Spitzer's Universe yes. that's all about that. Uh, but that's but that's Father Spitzer's own idiosyncratic take on that question. So I would say study the lives of Catholic scientists, and uh, and they're, they're all going to do it differently because they all have different interests and different personalities. Really, the, the, the key is what are your gifts? What are your loves? What are your interests? Yeah. Bring love and humility and patience and virtue uh, to whatever you do, and the, and the dogged pursuit of truth, wherever that leads you. There you go. Brandon, thanks so much for your call. That opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Call to communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. Joe checks in via YouTube. Joe says, my wife is not Catholic. I am a recent convert. Now, I want to follow church teaching on sexual morality. She doesn't. She is not on board with NFP, natural family planning, and doesn't understand the problem with contraception. Can Dr. Anders advise me on how to navigate this situation? Thanks in advance. Very carefully. <laughs> yeah. Very carefully, right. Um, so let me say a word about uh, the church's teaching with contraception and then a little bit less about the, the marital difficulty. So basically the church's position, and I think this is evident to reason is that the reason that we are sexual beings is so that we can reproduce. It's for procreation. And because God and nature want that to take place, it's attendant generally by a fair amount of pleasure. I mean, our, our bodies are attracted to those things that are good for us and for the propagation of the species. But unlike other sexual beings, we also have the capacity to reason. And so we can, we can bring critical reason and decision-making to the use of all of our faculties, eating, sexuality, whatever it might be, and, uh, and discern their proper use for the common good and the good of the person. Uh, now, there's another effect of human sexuality, which is it tends to establish uh, emotional bonds between the people that participate in this activity. And lo and behold, something else tends to happen, and that tends to be babies, right? Mm -hmm. So all those things tend to, they, they, they sort of coalesce around a common center, right? The attraction and the, and the, uh, and the intimacy of the, of the partners, uh, procreation, and the desire to procreate, um, create a kind of <clears throat> structure in which a family life can fruitfully emerge. Now, when you begin to break those things apart, the, the sexual urge, the intimacy of sexual union, procreation, then things tend to break down, right? And, yeah. and the people who suffer the most in this generally are the children, right? So kids have an interest in having two parents that love each other and are committed to their family as the first cell of society and to their primary vocation. And when you separate that unitive aspect, that, that, that bonding of parents from, to one another, the, the sexual pleasure and the procreation of children, 
then then that uh, uh, that sort of organic unity is, is broken, and 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 lives are generally hurt. So that that's more or less the position now. One way to do that is through contraception. Immediately, you're breaking the sexual act away from uh, the procreation of children and mm-hmm. the, the end that it has in the generation of a family, and towards the selfish indulgence of the sexual pleasure. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, it's not necessary to contracept in order to enjoy marital union. Right? It's really the reason people contracept is they want to have the pleasure of human sexuality without the consequences, without the necessary entailments. Mm-hmm. And that tends towards selfishness and the objectification of oneself and the other. And the consequences both to oneself and to the wider society are quite dire. And so the contraceptive society in which we live is one in which, by and large, uh, you know, the sort of sexual marketplace and, and dynamics of sexual interaction have, have favored um, the lusts of men over the dignity of women. Um, that's that's just the way it's played out in society. Mm-hmm. So, the, uh, you know, you, I would say treat your wife with all of the dignity that the theology behind the church's view on contraception mm-hmm. calls for. There, there's a way of implementing the church of te- church's teaching that's, that can be quite mechanical and selfish, believe it or not. There's, mm-hmm. there's a way of being, like insisting on, well, I've got to do this my way and you have to comply and... We're going to chart these things in these mo- days of the week, month and blah, blah, blah. And it can be very dehumanizing if you don't remember the end of the practice, which is charity, the love of the other, the dignity of your spouse. So that's the way you have to live it. Joe, lots to uh, pray about there and ponder on. Now, thanks so much for checking in with us on YouTube. It's called a communion here on EWTN. Our phone number, 833 833- 288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833-288-3986. Here's an email from Kenny. First of all, love your show. The most interesting thing I've learned listening to your show is that there are so many other historical books and letters that support the Catholic theology. St. Ignatius of Antioch is one example. The question that I get from Protestants is, quote, If these books and letters are so important, why were they not included in the Bible? Since Protestants are so wrapped up in sola scriptura, can you imagine the possible divisions that could have been avoided if this evidence had been included by the original councils on what to include and what not include in the Bible? Thanks, Kenny. Yeah, I appreciate the question. The the objection presumes a wrong doctrine of the Bible. Ah. See the Protestant objection who says, "Well, if if the church fathers were so important, why not why not declare them to be canonical scripture?" That would have cleared the whole thing up. That that's that's the position, right? Right, right. That assumes that the Bible is the final arbiter of Christian doctrine. So, if you're a Protestant and you think, "Well, we need to have a book to settle our theological differences," so why not be as explicit in po- as possible in the book? And the fact that the Catholic Bible and for that matter, the Protestant Bible, are inherently ambiguous on so many theological questions. It's not sufficient to settle our disputes. Why don't we just pack it with all the right information so it can settle our disputes? That assumes that God gave us the Bible to settle our disputes. That is false. The purpose of the Bible is not to be a rule of faith that determines the content of Christian faith or settles our theological disputes. It's not the function of the Bible. If that is the function of the Bible, it does a lousy job. (laughs) Because the Bible is the source of most of the disagreement within the Christian faith. Most Christians who disagree on theological issues differ on the interpretation of biblical texts and their significance. That's not its job description. Christ actually gave us a means of determining the content of Christian faith and of settling theological dispute. It was the teaching office of the church. So a better question is not, why don't you pack the Bible full of the church fathers? The better question is, why don't you listen to the church fathers and to the church that Christ founded? When Christ made provision for handing on the faith, he didn't say, go unto all nations and hand them the Bible. He said, go unto all nations and teach everything I've commanded you, oral tradition. And I'll be with you, promise of divine assistance. I'll be with you to the end of the age. So listen to Christ and the church that he founded. Whoever hears you, hears me, Christ said. Good advice. All right, Kenny, thank you so much uh, for checking in with us here on EWTN's Call to Communion. Plenty of time for your phone calls at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Nancy Joe is listening to us on Facebook today. She says, uh, Dr. David, if you're Catholic... 
When someone asks you what religion are you or what church do you belong to, what do you say? Do you say Roman or Christian or church and why and uh, what is the significance? I generally say Catholic because that's the that's the broadest uh, category to which I belong that would differentiate me from other forms of Christianity. And most people in the West know what that means. Most of them would tend to equate it with Roman Catholic, although that's a mistake. There are Catholics that are not Roman Catholics. Mm-hmm. There are Catholics that are Eastern Rite Catholics of various descriptions, and they are every bit as much a part of the Church as I am. Um, but uh, for most people, that distinction is... Uh, is not very helpful and not familiar with it. So yeah. I generally just say Catholic, but I'd be perfectly happy saying Roman Catholic, Romanist, Papist. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I, all that's fine. You Papist. I'm a Papist. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it is called a communion here on EWTN. We'll get to back to the phones in a moment. Question here from Jean. Uh, Jean says, I listened with interest to your statement about how we can pray for those who have passed on who might be in purgatory. My question is, does a loved one who might be in purgatory, do they know we are praying for them, and do they know that we are thinking of them? Thanks, Jean. No idea. Absolutely no idea. Not necessary for me to know that. Uh, I think that it's possible. I think that if it would be beneficial to them, then or even maybe helpful, helpful, maybe even uh, in a merciful, kind-hearted way, God might make that information known to them. But I have no revelation from God guaranteeing that he does that. Yeah. Uh, so no idea, no idea at all. That's but, right. uh, you know, from my point of view, you know, like if you have a loved one who's unconscious, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, maybe they're on oxygen and they've got an IV or whatever, and you, they need physical care, you're not going to withhold the care uh, because they're not aware that you're providing it, right? Now, now uh, the souls in purgatory are not unconscious. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm just using that as an analogy yeah. that whether or not they're aware of my prayers is not going to impede me from doing it, and I still have the satisfaction of knowing that I'm doing something on behalf of those I love. Sure. Appreciate that, and it's called a communion here on EWTN. Back to the phones in a moment. A quick question from Sherman watching us on YouTube today. Could you please explain the Catholic view of the rapture? Yeah, it doesn't exist. <laughs> that's the that's that is the that is the Catholic view. So the the idea of the rapture um, in Protestant theology is a is a novelty. It's a modern idea, modern myth, invented by a fellow named John Nelson Darby. And the idea is that before the end of time, Christ will come back invisibly, secretly, even though Scripture knows of no such coming of Christ, and that He will snatch true quote unquote true believers out of space and time cart them off, uh, you know, to some Empyrean heaven for seven years, and then all hell will break loose on planet Earth, quite literally. And then Jesus will come back with the elect after seven years, and he'll land in Jerusalem and set up an earthly kingdom, reign from Jerusalem as a human king for a thousand years. Uh, The temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt, animals will be sacrificed, and Hebraic religion will be restored, and Christ will rule over this Jewish Gentile, you know, Hebraic cult-like religion in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. None of that's biblical. None of that's traditional. None of that is given to us by divine revelation. The, the, where that idea came from was the fundamentalist belief that Scripture is woodenly, literalistically true in all of a level. So there, are no, there, aren't, there aren't sort of hierarchies of interpretive authority within the Bible. Everything is just true. You know, face value is the man on the street would understand the text. And in the Old Testament, there are these passages about Israel conquering the nations and ruling over the world— and the New Testament understands all of those in a, in a highly allegorical, symbolic way to be filled, fulfilled within the kingdom of God that Christ inaugurated. But fundamentalists, because of their peculiar method of interpreting Scripture, assume those things have to be literally fulfilled. And because Christ did not conquer the Romans and set up a physical kingdom in Jerusalem, they figure he must do that at some future time. But since the church doesn't operate militaristically, they understand the church to be a problem for the fulfillment of that eschatological plan. Mm. Hence the necessity of moving the church out of space and time, getting it out of the way. One one, uh, one writer referred to the church as a parenthesis in God's plan. Got to get rid of the parenthesis so that God can fulfill those putative prophecies to the nation-state of Israel and then bring the church back at the end. Well, none of that is biblical, and it doesn't reflect the way the New Testament understands the old, the proper methods for interpreting the Bible, and it certainly isn't the practice of Christians, Protestant or Catholic, for the first 1900 years of the church. It really is only a very, very modern 
invention that arises with the advent of fundamentalism, which again is a very modern movement. Now, the Catholic view is that Christ will come back at the end of time and judge the living and the dead, but none of this secret coming and none of this floating mm -hmm. off to heaven and then coming back. Now, there is a passage in, in uh, First, uh, First Thessalonians 4 that speaks about being caught up to the Lord in the air. Mm -hmm. That is a Catholic belief, but it doesn't refer to the rapture. It just refers to the glorious coming of the Lord at the end of time. Okay, kind of like uh, when, when someone would go forth to meet you you know, at, yeah, exactly. At He's a, coming on the clouds a, of heaven. We yeah. come up, we greet him, and come back with him. And then everybody comes back. Exactly. All right. Very good. And uh, thank you so much for your question. In a moment, we're going to be talking with Emma in Houston, listening on the EWTN app. We do have some lines open for you if you have a question for Dr. David Anders, or if you'd like to tell us, hey, what's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? That number eight three three two eight eight EWTN. That's eight three three two eight eight. 3986. Call to communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. Stay with us. We live in a world of extreme polarization, often consumed by anger and anxiety, a climate that is dividing our country and our world, a division so wide there is even confusion within our church. And today, most secular news sources only serve to deepen this divide. But at Catholic News Agency, our mission is to be a witness to the truth of our Catholic faith, providing trustworthy, relevant, and timely news affecting the global church, as well as in-depth coverage of the Pope, the Vatican, the church in the U.S., and the ongoing battle for the culture of life. Every day, CNA's reporters and editors maintain a continuous, faithful watch on the people and the events that impact lives and the souls of Catholics, delivering more news from a Catholic perspective than anyone else. Catholic News Agency, a service of EWTN News. Trusted, timely, Catholic. Engage at catholicnewsagency.com. This is Dr. David Anders. If you missed part of today's show, catch the Encore tonight at 11 Eastern. Check out the podcast anytime at EWTNradio.net and click Podcasts. From Rome to your home, EWTN's Vatican Bureau lets you watch all of the important events from Rome, even if you don't have a TV. Using the latest technology, we've made it possible to watch the latest news from the Holy See, all delivered directly to your home. It's easy. Watch live on EWTN YouTube and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. Tomorrow on More to Life, Imperfectly Perfect. Is perfectionism holding you back? will help you break free through God's grace. That's tomorrow on More to Life. Now back to Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. Glad you could join us for Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. Back to the phones now at 833-288-EWTN. Here is Emma in Houston listening on the EWTN app. Hey, Emma, what's on your mind today? Hello, um, I want to start by saying very grateful for your show that continues to catch, uh, catechize us. Uh, so the question that I have is in regard um, is in regard to in vitro fertilization. So I have a friend who is not Catholic who would like to go to a sperm bank to be impregnated and have a child. She is definitely a very big love in her heart. And if we also come from a culture in which not having children, a woman not having children after a certain age, is viewed, it's, 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 it's a big deal. So she wants to go ahead and, and have that child on her own. I have already told her that from a Catholic standpoint, it's not, it's, not, it's not good. But I have not been able to explain to her why and kind of convincing and, you know, convince her about uh, her choice. And the second part of the question is if she decides to go ahead with it, and I am a sporting friend. I take her to the to the clinic and all of it. Would that be complicit in her the choice that she has made? Um, so I'm still at the office. So I'm going to hang up and listen to your um, answer. Great, These wonderful okay. questions. Thank you. I really appreciate the question. So, to begin with, when you have a single woman who would like to have a child and she doesn't have a husband and it doesn't look like a possibility. Uh, but she's got that maternal heart, wants to care for someone. That's a beautiful thing. And absolutely nothing wrong with that. And there are many lawful ways 
to gratify that maternal instinct. Now, for many people, that might be, I mean, I have I have single female Catholic friends who lavish that kind of love and attention on nieces and nephews and are very involved in their lives. Uh, there is even a situation in which someone like that might be able to adopt a child. Maybe sure. somebody else doesn't want to adopt and give mm-hmm. them a wonderful home. Uh, one of the difficulties with in vitro fertilization as a solution to that to that uh, urge or a way to gratify that urge is that you're making a decision now to to take a child away from the father that they'll never know. Because, see, naturally children deserve to have a mother and a father. Now, we recognize that's not always possible. So a lot of kids, you know, maybe mom dies, dad dies, or maybe dad's a deadbeat dad and he's not in the picture. And that's no fault of the child. There's no fault of the mother in a situation like that. But you're not going to positively choose that. You're not going to seek out situations where you can separate a child from his father or her father. And now, if someone's already separated from their parent and there's nothing you can do about it, you, you make the best of a bad situation. Sure, you can give sure. that child a home and love on them. But you don't want to you don't want to create that situation. So when when we when we make use of our sexual faculty to bear children, it it should be in the best possible scenario one one in which I'm trying to bring a child into the world with the best with what that child genuinely deserves and needs. Right? Not not the best not the best under the circumstances, but the best that can be possible. Right? Which is I'm gonna male and woman, man and woman get together in intimate union to make a family together because every child deserves, even though they're not always given, a father and a mother. So mm-hmm. I don't want to seek out what's intrinsically unjust. Yeah. Right? I don't want to do that. Um, now, the, uh, the question, can you drive your friend to the clinic? No, you cannot. And here's why. Um, uh, there, there are two kinds of cooperation with evil. There's, um, there's material cooperation with evil and mm-hmm. there's formal cooperation with evil. Material cooperation with evil is sometimes allowable. And that would be like, you know, could you manufacture the car that your friend drove in <laughs> to go get the IVF? Mm-hmm. Obviously, the manufacturers of the automobile mm-hmm. have no direct involvement in her particular chosen act. Right? Right, right. Proximate material cooperation, however, is like, say, you work in an abortion clinic and the, and the, and the abortionist says, hand me the scalpel. You can't mm. you can't say well I don't intend this abortion I'm just I'm just I'm just an intermediary here uh, that's too close to the action, and it gets closer to what the church calls formal cooperation with evil. Formal cooperation with evil is when you intend the evil outcome, you desire the thing that should not be mm-hmm. done, yeah. and I'd say in in this case driving someone to the clinic so they can do something intrinsically immoral, pleading well I don't really want them to get IVF but I'm just along you know to be a good supportive friend. It's too close to the action. It's more like proximate material cooperation bordering on formal cooperation. So what can you do instead? Everything else. I hope she doesn't make this decision. But if she does, it's not the child's fault. And at that point, that child's going to need a lot of love. And there's no reason you can't be one of the people that gives all that love. And I would recommend, you know, never... From the moment uh, inception occurs... Mm-hmm. Conception, rather, uh, not a word of judgment. Like it's too late at that point. You can't do anything about it, right? The child's an inevitability. So you, you at that point, you 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 love, you support in all the ways that are appropriate to the life of a child, to the life of a mother. And um, but I wouldn't, but I wouldn't drive to the clinic. Yeah, Emma, thank you so, so much for your call, and also God bless you for your concern for your friend. And uh, we're going to go now to Tricia in Martinez, Georgia listening on one of our great stations there, St. Paul Radio. Hey there, Tricia. what's on your mind today? Hi. Well, um, my question is, I have a friend who just told me that, um, well, for instance, I prayed today the um, joyful mysteries of the rosary, mm-hmm. and then tomorrow I do sorrowful, Wednesday, you know, glorious, and so on. She said we should really pray all the mysteries every day. And I was just wondering, Dr. Anders, uh, opinion about that. Nope. I appreciate the question, by the way. That sounds like superstition to me. In fact, it is superstition. The The rosary, like every form of devotion and every form of prayer, has but one criterion, and that is that it moves us to charity. St. Augustine of Hippo once said that the entire dispensation of our faith, all of it, everything that we do as Catholics, we should regard like a chariot or a road the purpose of which is to convey us to charity. 
the, 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 the means themselves are not important. We won't have Eucharistic adoration in heaven. We won't need it. We won't have baptism in heaven. We won't need it. We'll have Christ himself. Like all of these things are a means to an end. The end is union with the Lord in charity. And so what the great spiritual writers tell us about the life of prayer is, let's say you begin your rosary, and you get halfway through the first decade, and suddenly you find yourself caught up in a kind of wordless love, where your heart is filled with, with joy in God. Or maybe the Lord reveals to you some area of sin in your life, something that you need to ponder in the depths of your heart that needs to be corrected or rooted out. Some, some deep revelation about your spiritual condition comes to you. The thing to do at that point is to put the rosary down, they're all agreed on this. All the authorities are agreed on this. The rosary is a tool, right? And uh, th there are those who think, well, you know, I have to do this many decades on this many days in this particular order and unify. I'm always forgetting a bead. You know, when I pray the rosary, I, I'm, I'm forever like getting nine Hail Marys in there instead <laughs> of that tenth one. Right? Mary does not care. Like if I get nine Hail Marys in, that's nine better than I otherwise would have. Yeah. Right? Again, the point is not some numerological magical condition where if I perform the ritual right, then then I'm going to get some, you know, insert coin and outcomes magical grace box. It doesn't work that way. This is something for purposes of meditation and prayer. Now, there's a reason to have the ritual. Rituals instill habits in us. And having a formula to follow prompts our meditations. That's the point of the mysteries that we meditate on. Not Not because they have some sort of quasi-magical efficacy, but because we, St. Paul says, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, not on things below. So we contemplate these things to set our hearts on Christ above. But that's the point. The point is setting our heart on Christ above, not the ritual itself, which is just a means to that end. All right, very good. Uh, Tricia, thank you so much uh, for your call. It's called a communion here on EWTN. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986. Here's an email now from John in Boise, Idaho. Dr. Anders, why is it that Catholic apologists seem to lean far more on the extra-biblical teachings of the so-called Church Fathers than they do on the teachings of Jesus and the Apostles? Seems to me that many Catholic doctrines and dogmas originate from somewhere other than orthodoxy. Thanks, John in Boise. Yeah, thanks. So I don't know about other Catholic apologists. I can only speak for this one. Sure. I, I, I think if you listen to my show, you'll find citations of a lot of authorities and ideas, everything from secular psychologists and atheist philosophers and scientists to biblical texts, church fathers, and, you know, occasionally the back of a baseball card, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I'm not very discriminating in that way. But I, I at least f from my point of view, I think the— I'd say probably a good two-thirds of my authoritative citations for Catholic doctrine come from Holy Scripture. And a lot of that has to do with my own formation in seminary. I, I just was sort of really Bible-heavy kind of in my own mm -hmm. uh, acquiring of the Christian faith. And it makes sense to me. And I know it's a language that a lot of non-Catholics speak, so it seems convenient for me to cite Holy Scripture. But I, uh, uh, I would beg to differ that Catholic doctrine is not founded in divine revelation— and so divine revelation is not limited to the Bible. That's, that's one thing to keep in mind. Yes. Divine, the Bible is divine revelation, but so is sacred tradition. Mm -hmm. And the Church Fathers are preeminent witnesses to that tradition, and so they, they should be cited. They're also men of great holiness and intelligence and discretion, and so their, their, their words are intrinsic, excuse me, intrinsically worth listening to just because they were wise and insightful and great practitioners of the Christian faith as well as commentators upon it. Um, but uh, you know, also the nature is divine revelation, in a different mode. It's not mm -hmm. you know the sort of divine breathed revelation of Holy Scripture. But you know, if I if I if I kick a rock, and I learn something about reality, and Saint Thomas says that God is everything virtually. Let me define his terms. You know, Saint Paul said that in Him we live and move and have our being. Mm -hmm. Right. What does it mean for God to be everything virtually? Well, uh, it's the way that the conclusions are contained within the axioms or the premises of a proof. If you ever took geometry, you know, you have these axioms of geometry and these first principles, and then from them you can reason to certain conclusions. That same kind of relationship exists metaphysically between the being of God and the contingent being of creatures. Like, we, we proceed from God's very own being. 
And so reality itself manifests and gives witness to and is reflective of the very nature of God in its own mode. And so even even a rock or a stone is revelatory in that sense. Mm -hmm. And so it's reasonable to to confront the witness of reality as broadly conceived as possible. All right. John, thanks so much uh, for your email. Good to hear from you in Boise. It's called a communion here on EWTN. One of our long-running programs on this network is, of course, The World Over with uh, Raymond Arroyo, where you're going to hear the latest political and cultural reporting and analysis on topics of interest to Catholics and people of faith and really no faith as well. Right now, you can get news from The World Over in your email inbox every week from us. Sign up today by visiting EWTN.com. Click on the word subscribe, and we will take it from there. EWTN.com, then look for the word subscribe. Let's go now to a Diana in Urbana, Illinois, listening on Sirius XM, Channel 130. Diana, what's on your mind today? Hi. Um, yes, I was listening to one of those people that called in earlier about the uh, abortion, and mine maybe not isn't as severe as that, but I was a legal assistant for over 20-some years, and I assisted in defending some really bad people and helping people end their marriages and defending pedophiles and criminals, and I just didn't know, I'm, was that, am I in trouble? <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for the phone call. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you so much for your vocation to legal work and the justice system. I, I can't thank you enough for the work you did in the defense firm and in the divorce firm. I, I think this is very admirable that you did this, and I don't think that in any way would I accuse you of being complicit with evil. The only exception to that rule would be if you were, say, you know, in a law firm that broke the law. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't countenance that. That's intrinsically immoral. But it is not intrinsically. See, the way our legal system works, and you know this very well, it's an adversarial system. So, you, you know, you, you can't have a defendant without a plaintiff. Right. I mean, it's it, it works that way. And you can't have a prosecution without a defense. And so the, the system itself requires that dynamic because it in, in the aggregate, it's better equipped to, to produce justice. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. I knew a judge one time. A uh, client went before the judge at a, at a hearing. The judge says, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Your Honor, I want justice. The judge said, we don't do that here. We give out money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I mean, I, I get that it's not perfect, but it's, it's an attempt to uh, approximate justice. Mm -hmm. And due process is absolutely necessary for the integrity of the system. And for there to be due process, you have to have defense attorneys. Now, when it comes to the question of divorce, now obviously there are people who seek divorce for illegitimate reasons. Yeah. I mean, that happens, to yeah. be sure. Um, but di divorce in itself is is sometimes a necessary evil. Uh, I mean, plenty of occasions when maybe somebody's in an abusive situation, and they got to get out of there. They got to seek the protection of the court against an abusive spouse. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and even, you know, even if somebody is guilty of a crime, um, you know, you, you mentioned some pretty bad folks. Well, look, they have dignity. And the tendency in our culture and in our media is to single out certain sort of crimes as being so reprehensible that the dignity of the person is allegedly or putatively stripped away. And nothing's too bad, you know, no punishment is too harsh for that individual. You know, let's give it to them with both fists or whatever. And... And even those people are denied the dignity of truth, of due process, of the presumption of innocence, standards of reasonable doubt, these kinds of things. And so, no, the legal system is actually grounded in the principles of Catholic natural law. Our, our legal system in America in particular, with its roots in English common law, um, emerge at a time in the world when, the, when canon law was being formulated. So civil law and canon law were both sort of coming online in the 12th mm -hmm. century. And, uh, and they emerged out of the same Catholic theological moral milieu for the same reasons. Diane, thanks so much uh, for your call from Urbana. Let's go now to John in Lincoln, Nebraska, listening on the Great Spirit Catholic Radio. Hey, John, what's on your mind today? Hey, thanks for taking my call. What's on my mind is hell, the concept of hell or the reality of hell or whatever, uh, the creation of hell. Um, I was just wondering how an all-loving, all-caring God could be played like hell, to just shove somebody into the front of the fire to burn for all eternity. Also, I'm under the impression, <laughs> under the impression, I guess I 
I, I hear other things from other Christians, not necessarily Catholic, that hell was not originally created for humans, but it was actually created for angels or something like that. Um, I was just wondering what your take on this was, because I don't see an all-loving, caring God tossing somebody in fire for all eternity based on 70, 80, 100 years of the life. You know, like, I mean, sure. come on, give me a sure. The first, right. part of, the first part of the call was a little garbled. Did you get all that? The, the, the long and the short of it is the justice of hell. Okay. All right. So I'm going to make a couple observations. First of all, um, we have the capacity to make a hell of our own lives. I think that's fairly obvious. Oh, yeah. And I know in my own life, many times I have known the right thing to do, and I have chosen not to do it, and I have known that there will be consequences, and I've known what the consequences are, and I have gone and suffered the consequences and wished that I weren't and recognized that I chose them. That's happened to me more than once in my life. Sure. And sometimes those consequences were dire. Mm. Right? Uh, that's what free will entails. That's what moral responsibility entails. And, and that many times that, that the consequences include alienation from the good of my own conscience and from an awareness of what is just, true, and good. In my own desire to be at one with those things, with the good, the true, and the beautiful, and the recognition that I'm not, and the pain that, that I experience in that moment. Now, that is metaphysically what hell is. It is conscious separation from the good, the true, and the beautiful, namely God, chosen. So I experience this every, well, not every day, hopefully, but I have experienced it in my life, and mm -hmm. it's, it's a daily occurrence on planet Earth, I should put it that way. C.S. Lewis once wrote that at the end of the world will be two kinds of people, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. And so in one sense, hell is merely a prolongation, an extension of the dignity of freedom that God grants to us every day. All right. Secondly, uh, why articulate a dogma of hell? See, the mysteries of the faith could remain mysteries. Like God doesn't have to, I mean, there could be all kinds of things that we don't know that are true about the afterlife or the nature of God or redemption that God just, you know, seems to keep his mouth shut, so to speak. Why reveal these things? To influence our behavior. So the purpose of articulating a doctrine of hell or preaching a doctrine of hell is to influence people towards the life of charity and grace and virtue and to encourage them not to fall into the hell that they create for themselves every day, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now, the purpose of articulating a doctrine of hell is not to give us, I believe, not to give us a perfectly clear, utterly rational, penetrated vision of ultimate metaphysical reality. And I think that's the way a lot of people approach it. They approach it like, okay, I need to fit this into a rational syllogism uh, you know, a, a, a philosophical argument that hangs together and makes perfect clear sense to me about the nature of ultimate things. And the catechism of the Catholic Church suggests that's not the way we ought to think about dogmas always. It says that dogmas are lights, lights, L-I-G-H-T. They illumine our path. So they have for us a kind of existential significance that I think is more valuable than what they might tell us about sort of metaphysically ultimate things, which are obscure to us and uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that exceed our capacity to rationally grasp. Um, so if I approach the dogma rationalistically, I admit to you that it is a mystery that I cannot justify. I mean, I'm not, I, 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 I cannot do the calculus where eternal punishment equals temporal sin. I, I can't. And I don't, I've, I, I, I've heard arguments for that, that I find unpersuasive. Um, I, I can, what I can leave you with is evil is a mystery, hell is a mystery, but the doctrine approached existentially can motivate me in my life of faith and charity and help me to avoid the hell of my own experience that I can incur for myself daily and at any moment when I choose to separate myself from the good, the true, and the beautiful. Great call. Thanks so much for it. And here is Joe now in Massachusetts listening on YouTube. Hey, Joe, what's on your mind today? Hi. Um, I kind of have a simple question. My question is, um, what would happen if a pope were to release a document that is in direct conflict with uh, church teaching? 
Right. One of two things would happen. Either we would conclude that we had misunderstood church teaching, right? That, mm. that's, that's one thing. That's yeah. probably the most likely circumstance. We misunderstood church teaching, and mm -hmm. so what appears to be a contradiction is not, and there's a qualification that we're failing to make. St. Thomas Aquinas said, when faced with a contradiction, draw a distinction. So there's a distinction here that is called for that we're missing. So we've, we haven't adequately nuanced doctrine to account for this possibility, but now we're going to go to work and do that, uh -huh. right? Uh, or it's always possible that, uh, you know, we had a situation in the Middle Ages, we had three people claiming to be Pope at the same time. So it's, it's historically a possibility that you can have, you know, that sort of situation. And obviously, if the anti-Pope la lays something out, then that doesn't, it's not binding. Um, uh, uh, now, there's also, the, there's a third possibility, which is that popes don't always operate infallibly. And so papal documents are of varying degrees of authority mm. and weightiness. And there are times when popes can articulate doctrinal positions that are in error. And it's happened before. I mean, there was a, 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 a John the 22nd in the, in the 15th century, uh, 14th century, what, uh, personally held an erroneous theological position, and he was censured by the Parisian faculty of theology and other bishops, and he eventually came to his senses and corrected himself. And then the subsequent pope issued a binding, infallible dogmatic declaration to correct the previous pope's error, which had never been dogmatically defined. So either we misunderstood church tradition and mm. we need to qualify it, perhaps the teaching itself was not delivered infallibly, or maybe it was delivered imprudently, and with, with poor specification. So that's another possibility. Pope, a pope can speak imprecisely mm. and ambiguously in a way that scandalizes, and that maybe he needs to get a better editor if that is the case. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, or, you know, maybe you've got some papal schism where you've got multiple claimants and some anti-pope does this. So, I mean, I'm just throwing out different possibilities. Sure, sure. Very good. And Joe, thanks so much for your call. Let's go to Rob now in Grand Rapids, listening on the great Holy Family Radio. Hello, Rob. What's on your mind today, sir? Yes. Um, I've seen it before where people were able to talk someone out of having an abortion because they drove them to the abortion clinic and that was their whole intention. Why would it be sinful if that girl wanted to drive her friend to the IVF clinic with the sole intention of trying to talk her out of it, knowing she could get an Uber or anything else she wanted to? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Well, intention is the is the whole is the big thing there, isn't it? Right. Intention yeah. is the big thing. Um, you know, I. Um, uh, if your intent is to prevent an evil, then you're not then you're not cooperating. Uh, you know, I'm I'm giving you what I think is a prudent pastoral judgment here, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 you know, if the goal is to be the way it was articulated to me was, you know, if I am a supportive friend and trying to help her out, right? To me, that sounds like that sounds like proximate material cooperation, bordering on formal cooperation. Yeah, yeah. All right, Joe, there you go, and uh, thanks for being our last caller on today's program. Couldn't get to Adriana in Miami or Chris in Atlanta. If you folks would call us back uh, on our next program or on the program of your choice, we'll be glad to put you at the head of the line. Hey, Dr. David Anders, thank you, sir. Thanks, Tom. We do this program on EWTN Radio five days a week, Monday through Friday. 2 p.m. Eastern for our live show and 11 p.m. for the Encore. You can check out the podcast anytime by going to EWTNRadio.net, EWTNRadio.net. We'll have today's program posted in just a couple of hours for you. On behalf of our fantastic team here, I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here on EWTN's Call to Communion. Have a great day, and God bless. EWTN, communicating.